shall be three. Let's meet again in thunder, lightning, or in rain. When the hurly-burly's done, when the battle's lost and won. That'll be ere the set of sun. <laughs> Where the place? Upon the hest. There to meet with Macbeth. I come, Grey Malkin. Paddock calls. Oh. Anon! Fair is foul and foul is fair. Hover through the fog and fill the air. What bloody man is that? You can report a seamith by his plight of the revolt of new estate? This is the sergeant who, like a good and hardy soldier, fought gets my captivity. Hail, brave friend, and say to the king the knowledge of the broil, as thou didst leave it. Down foot stood. As two spent swimmers that do cling together and choke their art. The merciless MacDonwald, worthy to be a rebel, for to that the multiplying villainies of nature do swarm upon him. From the western isles of Kearns and Gallowglasses is supplied, and fortune, on his damned quarrel smiling, showed like a rebel's whore. But all's too weak, for brave Macbeth, well he deserves that name, disdaining fortune with his brandished steel, which smoked like bloody execution, like Bella's minion, carved out a passage till he faced a slave, which ne'er shook hands, no bed farewell to him, till he had seamed him from the nave to the chops, and fixed his head upon our battlements. Oh, valiant cousin, worthy gentleman. As whence the sun gins his reflection, shipwrecking storms and direful thunders break. So from that spring whence comfort seemed to come, discomfort swells. Mark, King of Scotland, Mark, with no sooner justice had than valor arms compelled these skipping kerns to trust the heels. But the Norwayan lord, surveying vantage with furbished arms and new supplies of men, began a fresh assault. <coughs> this made not this our captains Macbeth and Banquo? Yes, a sparrow's eagle or the hair of the lion, if I say so, I must report they were as cannons, overcharged with double cracks. So they doubly redoubled their strokes upon the foe. Although they meant to bathe in reeking wounds, or memorize another Galgatha, I cannot tell. But I am faint. My gash is cried for help. So well thy words become thee as thy wounds. They smack of honor both. Go. Get him, surgeons. Who comes here? The worthy Thane of Ross. When a haste looks through his eyes, so should he look that seems to speak things strange. God save the king. Whence came it, thou worthy Thane? From Fife, great king, where the Norwayan banners flout the sky and fan our people cold. Norway himself, with terrible numbers, assisted by their most disloyal traitor, a thane of Cawdor, began a dismal conflict, till that Bologna's bridegroom lapped in proof, confronted him with self-comparisons, point against point, rebellious arm against arm, curbed his lavish spirit, and to conclude, the victory fell on us. A great happiness. <laughs> that now Sreno, the Norway's king, craves composition. Nor would we deign him burial of his men to the dispersed at St. Combs Inch ten thousand dollars to our general use. No more that thing of Cardo shall receive our bosom interest. Go, pronounce his present death, and with his former title, greet Macbeth. I'll see it done. What he hath lost, double Macbeth hath won. Chestnuts in her lap, and munched and munched and munched. Give me, quoth I, art thee witch, 
the rump fed Runyon cries, but in a sieve all thither and sail, and like a rat without a tail, I'll do, I'll do, and I'll do. I'll give thee a wind. Starts kind. And I another. I myself have all the other. And the very ports they blow, all the quarters that they know. In the shipman's card, I'll drain him dry as hay. Sleep shall neither night nor day. Hang upon his penthouse lid. He shall live, a man forbid. Weary seven nights, nine times nine. Nine times nine. Shall he dwindle, peak and pine? Though his bark cannot be lost, yet it shall be to this toss. Look what I have. Show me, show me. Here I have a pilot's thumb. Practice homeward, it's to come. A drum, a drum, make that dot come. So foul and fair a day I have not seen. How far is Paul to Corey's? What are these? So withered and so wild in their attire, I look not like the inhabitants of the earth, and yet are aunts. Live you, or are you what that man may question? You seem to understand me, by each have once her choppy finger laying upon her skinny lips. You should be women. And yet your beard forbid me to interpret that you are so. Speak if you can. What are you? All hail, Macbeth. Hail to thee, Thane of Glamis. All hail, Macbeth. Hail to thee, Thane of Cardiff. All hail, Macbeth, that shall be king hereafter. Good sir, why do you start and seem to fear things that do sound so fair? In the name of truth, are you fantastical, or that indeed which outwardly you show? My noble partner, you greet with present grace and great prediction of noble having and of royal hope that he seems wrapped with all. To me you speak not. If you can look into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow and which will not, speak then to me, who neither beg nor fear your favors nor your hate. Hail, hail, hail. Lesser than Macbeth and greater. And greater. Not so happy yet, much happier. Much happier. Thou shalt get king, so thou be none. So all hail Macbeth and Banquo. All hail Macbeth and Banquo. Banquo and Macbeth, all hail. Stay, you imperfect speakers. Tell me more. By Sinnoh's death, I know I am Thane of Glamis. But how of Cawdor? Thane of Cawdor lives a prosperous gentleman, and to be king stands not with the prospect of belief, no more than to be Cawdor. Say from whence you owe this strange intelligence, but why upon this blast need you stop our way with such prophetic greeting? Speak! I charge you! The earth hath bubbles as the water has. And these are of them. Whither are they banished? Into the air. And what seemed corporal melted as breath into the wind. Would they had stayed? Were such things here as we do speak about? Or have we in upon the insane root that takes the reason prisoner? Your children shall be kings. You shall be king. The Thane of Cawdor too, went it not so. To the self same tune in words. Who oh dear? The king hath happily received, Macbeth, the news of thy success. And when he reads thy personal adventure in the rebels' fight, his wonders and his praises do contend, which should be thine or his. Silence with that. In view and all the rest of self same day, he finds thee in a stout Norway in the ranks. Now then a fear of what a self didst make, strange images of death. A slick as tail came post with post, 
and everyone did bear thy praises in his kingdom's great defense, and poured them down before him. We are sent to give thee from our royal master thanks, only to herald thee into his sight, not pay thee. And for an earnest of a greater honor, he bade me from him call thee Thane of Cawdor, in which edition, hail most worthy Thane, for it is thine. What? Can the devil speak true? The Thane of Cawdor lives. Why do you dress me in borrowed robes? Who was the Thane lives yet, but under heavy judgment bears that life which he deserves to lose. Whether he was combined with those of Norway, or did lie in the rebel with hidden help and vantage, or that with both he labored in his country's wrath, I know not. But treason's capital, confessed and proved, have overthrown him. Glamis and Thane of Cawdor. Great is his behind. Thanks for your pains. Do not wish your children shall be kings, when those that gave the Thane of Cawdor to me promised no less to them. That trusted home might yet enkindle you to the crown besides the Thane of Cawdor. But tis strange, and oftentimes to win us of our harm. The instruments of darkness tell us truth, win us with honest trifles, to betray us in deepest consequence. Cousins, a word, I pray you. Two truths are told, as happy prologue to the swelling act of the imperial theme. I thank you, gentlemen. This supernatural soliciting cannot be ill, cannot be good. If ill, why hath it given me the earnest of success commencing in a truth? I am Thane of Cawdor. If good, why do I yield to that suggestion whose image doth unfix my hair and make my seated heart knock at my ribs against the use of nature? Present fears are less than horrible imaginings. My thought, whose murder is yet but fantastical, Shake so my single state of man, that function is smothered in surmise, and nothing is but what is not. Look, how our partner's wrapped. If chance will have me king, why chance may crown me without my stir. New honors come upon him, like our strange garments cleave not to their mold, but with the aid of use. Crown what come may, time and hour runs through the roughest day. Worthy Macbeth, we stay upon your leisure. Give me your favor. My dull brain is wrought with things forgotten. Kind gentlemen, your pains are registered where every day I turn the leaf to read them. That is toward the king. Think upon what hath chanced, but one more time. The interim having waited, let us speak our free hearts each to other. Very gladly. So then, Enough. Come, friends. Done on Cardo? Are not those in commission yet returned? My liege, they are not yet come back. But I have spoke with one that saw him die, who did report that very frankly he confessed his treasons, implored your highness's pardon, and set forth a deep repentance. Nothing in his life became him like the leaving it. He died as one that has been studied in his death to throw away the dearest thing he owed, as twas a careless trifle. There's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. He was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. Oh, worthiest cousin! The sin of my ingratitude even now was heavy on me. Thou art so far before that the swiftest wing of recompense is slow to overtake thee. Would thou hadst less deserved that the proportion both of thanks and payment might have been mine. Only I have left to say, more is thy due than more than all can pay. The service and loyalty I owe in doing it pays itself. Your Highness's part is to receive our duties, and our duties are to your throne, with state children and servants, who do but what they should by doing everything safe toward your love and honor. Welcome, Pippa. I've begun to plant thee and will labor to make thee full of growing. 
noble Banquo that has deserved no less, nor must be known no less to have done so. Let me unfold thee and hold thee to my heart. There, if I grow, the harvest is your own. My plenteous joys want on in fullness, seek to hide themselves in drops of sorrow. Sons, kinsmen, thanes, and you whose places are the nearest, know that we will establish our estate upon our eldest, Malcolm, whom we name hereafter the Prince of Cumberland, which honor must not unaccompanied invest him only, but signs of nobleness like stars shall shine upon all deservers from hence to Inverness and bind us further to you. The rest is labor, which is not used for you. I'll be myself the harbinger and make joyful the hearing of my wife at your approach. <coughs> so humbly take my leave. My worthy Cardo. The Prince of Cumberland. That is a step on which I must fall down, or else overleap for in my way it lies. Stars, hide your fires. Let's not like to see my black and deep desires. The eye we get the hand, yet let that be, which the eye fears when it is done to see. True, worthy Banquo, he is full, so valiant, and in his commendations I am fed. It is a banquet to me. Let's after him, whose care has gone before to bid us welcome. It is a peerless kinsman. They met me in the day of success, and I have learned by the perfect report they have more in them than mortal knowledge. When I burned in desire to question them further, they made themselves air, into which they vanished. Whilst I stood wrapped in the wonder of it came missives from the king, who all hailed me Thane of Cardor, by which title before these weird sisters saluted me and referred me to the coming on of time with hail king that shalt be. This have I thought good to deliver thee, my dearest partner of greatness, that thou mightest not lose the dues of rejoicing by being ignorant of what greatness is promised thee. Lay it to thy heart and farewell. Glamis thou art, and Cardor, and shalt be what thou art promised. Yet do I fear thy nature. It is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Thou would be great, art not without ambition, but without the illness should attend it. What thou wouldst highly, that wouldst thou holily, wouldst not play false, and yet wouldst strongly win. Thou'st have great glamis, that which cries, thus thou must do if thou have it, and to do what thou wishest should be undone. Hie thee hither, that I may pour my spirit into thine ear, and chastise with the valor of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round, which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem to have thee crowned withal. What is your tidings? The king comes here tonight. Thou art mad to say it. Is not thy master with him, who works so, would have informed for preparation? So please it is true, our thane is coming. One of my fellows hath the speed of him, who almost dead for breath hath scarcely more than would make up his message. Give him tending. He brings great news. The raven himself is horse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. Come, 
You spirits that tend on mortal thoughts. Unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood and stop up the passage in access to remorse that no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell purpose nor keep peace between the fect and it. Come to my woman's breast and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers. Wherever in your sightless substances you wait on nature's mischief. Come, thick night, and pile thee in the dunnest smoke of hell, that my keen knife see not the wound it makes, nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry, Hold! Hold! Great Glamis, worthy Cardor, greater than both by the all hail hereafter. Thy letters have transported me beyond the ignorant present, and I feel now the future in the instant. My dearest love, Duncan comes here tonight. And when goes hence? Tomorrow, as he purposes. Oh, never shall sun that morrow see. Your face, my thing, is as a book where men may read strange matters. To beguile the time, look like the time. Bear welcome in your eye, in your hand, in your tongue. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under. He that's coming must be provided for, and you shall put the night's great business into my dispatch, which shall to all our nights and days to come give solely sovereign sway and master. We will speak further. Only look up clear. To alter favor ever is to fear. Leave all the rest to me. hath a pleasant seat. The air nimbly and sweetly recommends itself unto our gentle senses. This guest of summer, the temple haunting Marlet does approve by his loved mansionry that the heaven's breath smell wooingly here. No juddy, freeze, buttress, nor coin advantage, but this bird hath made his pendant bed and procreant cradle, where they most breed and haunt I have observed. The air is delicate. <coughs> see, see our honored hostess. The love that follows us sometime is our trouble, which still we think is love. Herein, I teach you how you should bid God ill this of your pains and thank us for your trouble. All our service in every point twice done and then done double. We're poor and single business to contend against those honors deep and broad wherein your majesty loads our house. Where is the thing of Cottle? We coursed him at the heels and had a purpose to be his purveyor, but he rides well and his great love, sharp as a spur, hath helped him to his home before us. Fair and noble hostess, we are your guests tonight. Your servants have theirs, themselves, and what is theirs in court to make 
There are it at your highness's pleasure. Still to return your own. Give me your hand. Conduct me to mine host. We love him highly and shall continue our graces towards him. By your leave, hostess. Quickly. If the assassination could tremble of consequence and catch with his surcease success, that by this blow might be the be all and end all here. But here, upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. But in these cases, we still have judgment here. That we but teach bloody instruction, which being taught would turn to plague the inventor. This even handed justice commends the ingredients of our poison chalice to our own lips. He's here in double trust. First, as I am his kinsman and subject, strong both against the deed, and then as his host. Who against the murderer shut the door, not bear the knife myself? Besides, this Duncan hath borne his faculty so meek, hath been so clear in his great office that his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet tongued against the deep damnation of his taking off. And pity, like a naked nude born babe seriding the blast, or heaven's cherubim. Horse upon the slightless couriers of the air shall blow the horrid deed into every eye. The tears shall drown the wind. I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition which overleaps itself and falls on the other. Oh no, what's news? He has almost sucked. Why have you left the chamber? Hath he asked for me? No, you not. He has. We will proceed no further in this business. He hath honored me of late. And I have bought golden opinions from all sorts of people, which should be worn in their newest gloss, not cast aside so soon. Was the hope drunk? Wherein you dressed yourself? Hath it slept since, and wakes it now to look so green and pale at what it did so freely. From this time such I account thy love. Art thou afeard to be the same in thine own act and valor as thou art in desire? Wouldst thou have that which thou esteemst the ornament of life? Then live a coward in thine own esteem, letting I dare not wait upon. I would like the poor cat advantage. Prithee, peace! I dare do all that may become a man. Who dares do more is none. What beast was it then that made you break this enterprise to me? When you durst do it, then you were man, and to be more than what you were, you would be so much more the man. No time! No place did adhere, and yet you would make both. They have made them, and that their fitness now does unmake you. I have given suck, and know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from its boneless gums and dashed the brains out. Had I so sworn as you have done to this? If we should fail. We fail. But screw your courage to the sticking place and will not fail. When Duncan is asleep, where to the rather shall his day's hard journey soundly invite? 
his two chamberlains. Will I, with wine and with sail, so convince that memory, the warder of the brain, shall be a fume, and the receipt of reason a lime back only? When in swinish sleep, and their drenched nature lies as in a dream, what cannot you and I perform upon their guarded Duncan? What not put upon his spongy officers who shall bear the guilt of our great quell? Bring forth men, children only, for thy undaunted mental should compose nothing but males. Will it not be received? When we have marked with blood those sleepy two of his own chamber and used their very daggers that they had done it. Who shall receive it any other as we shall make our griefs clamor upon his death? And I am settled and bend up each corporal agent to this terrible feat. Away and mark the time with fairest show. False face must hide what the false heart doth know. How goes the night, boy? The moon is down. I have not heard the clock. And she goes down at twelve. I take it tis later, sir. Hold. Take my sword. There's husbandry in heaven. Their candles are all out. Take thee that, too. A heavy summon lies like lead upon me. And yet I would not sleep. Merciful powers are straining me, the cursed thoughts that nature gives way to in repose. Give me my sword. Who's there? A friend. What, sir? Not yet a rest? The king is abed. He hath been in unusual pleasure and sent forth great largess to your offices. This diamond, he greets your wife withal by the name of most kind hostess and shut up in measureless contempt. Being unprepared, I will became the servant to defect. Which else should free of rot? All's well. Last night, I dreamt of the three weird sisters. To you they have shown some truth. I think not of them. <laughs> Yet, when we can entreat an hour to serve, we would spend it in some words upon that business, if you would grant the time. At your kindest leisure. If you shall cleave to my consent, what is it shall make honor for you? And so I lose none in seeking to augment it. But still, keep my allegiance clear, my bosom franchise. I shall be counseled. Good. Propose the while. Thanks, sir. The like to you. Go bid thy mistress. When my drink is ready, she strike upon the bell. Get thee to bed. Is this a dagger which I see before me? The handle toward my hand? Come, let me clutch thee. Thee not yet I see thee still. Art thou not fatal vision, sensible to feeling as to sight? Or art thou but a dagger of the mind, 
the false creation proceeding from the heat oppressed brain. I see thee yet, in form as palpable as this which now I draw. Thou marshalst me the way I was going, and such an instrument I was to use. Mine eyes are made fools of the other senses, or else with all the rest I see thee still. And on thy blade and dungeon, gouts of blood which is not so before. There's no such thing! It is a bloody business which informs us to mine eyes. Now o'er the one half world, nature seems dead. Wicked dreams abuse the curtain sleep. Witchcraft celebrates pale Hecate's offerings and withered murder alarmed by a sentinel, the wolf, whose house is watch, thus with his stealthy pace, with Tarquin's ravishing strides towards his design, moves like a ghost. Thou sure and firm setter, hear not my steps, which way they walk, for fear thy very stones prate of my whereabouts and take the present toward the time which now suits with it. Well, as I threat, he lives. Words to the heat of deeds, too cold breath gives. I go, and it is done. The bell invites me. Hear it not, Duncan, for it is a knell that summons thee to heaven or to hell. That which hath made them drunk hath made me bold. What hath quenched them hath given me fire. The fatal bellman that gives the stern good night. He is about it. The doors are open, and the surfeited grooms do mock their charge with snores. I have drugged their possets, that death and nature do contend about them whether they live or die. Who's there? What's up? <clears throat> Alack. I am afraid they have awaked, and tis not done. So tempt him not the deed confound us. Hark, I laid their daggers ready, he could not miss them. Had he not resembled my father as he slept, I had done. My husband. I have done the deed. Didst thou not hear a noise? I heard the owl scream and the crickets cry, did not use me. When? Now. As I ascended? Aye. Hark, who lies in the sacred chamber? Donald Payne! Oh, this is a sorry sight. A foolish thought to say a sorry sight. As one did laugh in his sleep. And one cried murder, that they did wake each other, I stood and heard them. But they did say their prayers and address them again to sleep. Well, there are two lodged together. One cried, God bless us and amen the other. As they had seen me with these hangman's hands, listening to their fear, I could not say amen when they did say, God bless us. Consider it not so deeply. But wherefore could not I pronounce amen? I had most need of blessing and amen stuck in my throat. These deeds must not be thought after these ways, so it will make us mad. Methought I heard a voice cry, sleep no more. Macbeth does murder sleep. The innocent sleep, sleep that knits of the raveled sleeve of care. The death of each day's life, sore labor's bath, balm of hurt minds. Great nature's second course, chief nourish in life's feast. What do you mean? Still I cried, sleep no more. To all the house, Glamis hath murdered sleep. And therefore, Cawdor shall sleep no more. Macbeth, 
shall sleep no more. Who was it that thus cried? Why, worthy thing, you do unbend your noble strength to think so brain sickly of things? Go get some water and wash this filthy witness from your hand. Why did you bring the daggers from the place? They must lie there. Go and carry them. Smear the sleepy grooms with blood. I'll go no more. I am afraid to think what I have done. Look on it again. I dare not. In firm of purpose, give me the daggers. Knocking. How is it with me that every noise appalls me? What hands are here? They pluck out mine eyes. Will all great Neptune's oceans wash the blood clean from my hand? No. This my hand will rather the multitudinous seas and carnadine, making the green one red. My hands are of your color, but I shame to wear a heart so white. Oh, I hear a knocking at the south entry. Retire we to our chamber, a little water clears us of this deed. See how easy it is then. Your constancy hath left you unattended. Talk no knocking, get on your nightgown, lest occasion call us and show us to be watchers. Be not lost so poorly in your thoughts. To you know my deed is best I've known myself. <laughs> Wake Duncan with thy knocking, I would thou couldst. Here's a knocking indeed. If men go for the coke gate, he should have all oh, turning the key. host. Oh, come in, Taylor. Here, you may roast your goose. <laughs> knock, knock. Never at quiet. And what are you? <laughs> Ooh, but this place is too cold for hell. I'll take a pour you no further. I thought to let one of every professors in to the everlasting bonfire. 
Anon! Anon! I pray you, remember the porter. Was it so late, friend, ere you went to bed that you did lie so late? Mary, sir. We were crowding to the second cock, and drink is provoker of three things. What three things does drink especially provoke? Mary, sir. Nose painting, sleep, and urine. <laughs> Let legery. It provokes and unprovokes. It provokes a desire, but it takes away the performance. Therefore, much dream may to be said in equivocator with lechery. It makes him and it mars him. It sets him on and sets him off. It persuades him and disheartens him. Makes him stand to and not stand to. <laughs> In conclusion, giving him the sleep, the lie, leaves him. <laughs> I believe drink gave thee the lie last night. That it did, sir. It was the thought of me, though I required him for his lie. And to think now, I was too strong for him. <laughs> though. He takes my legs sometimes. Yet, I will shift by casting him. <laughs> is my master stirring? I'm not thinking to waken him. Here he comes. Good morning, noble sir. Good morning, both. Is the king staying, worthy thing? <laughs> not yet. He did command me to call time on him. I'm off. I've almost slipped the hour. I'll bring you to him. I know this is a joyful trouble to you, but yet tis one. The labor we delight in physics pain. This is the door. I'll make so bold to call, for it is my limited service. Goes the king hence today. He does. He did appoint so. The night has been unruly. Where we lay, our chimneys were blown down, and as they say, lamentings heard in the air. Strange screams of death and prophesizing with accents terror. Of dire combustion and confused events new hatch to the woeful time. The obscure bird clamored the live long night. Some say the earth was feverish and did shake. It was a rough night. A young remembrance cannot parallel a fellow to it. Oh! What's the matter? Confusion now hath made his masterpiece. Most sacrilegious murder hath broke up the Lord's anointed temple and stole thence the life of the building. What is it you say? The life mean you as majesty? Approach the chamber and destroy your sight with a new gorgon. Do not bid me speak. See and then speak yourselves. Speak. The repetition in a woman's ear with murder as it fell. Oh, Banquo. Banquo. Our royal master's murdered. Well, alas! What in our house? Too cruel anyway. Dear Duff, I prithee, contradict thyself and say it is not so. When 
whoever died an hour before this chance, I had lived a blessed time. From this instance, there is nothing serious in mortality. All is but toys. Renowned and grace is dead. The wine of life is drawn, and the mere lees has left this vault to brag of. What is amiss? You are. You do not know it. The spring, the head, the fountain of your blood is stopped. The very source of it is stopped. The royal father's murdered. <sighs> ah. By whom? Those of his chamber, as it seemed, had done it. Their hands and faces were all bathed with blood, as were the daggers which we found unwiped upon their pillows. They stared and were distracted. No man's life was to be trusted with them. Oh, yet I do repent of my fury oh, my that I did kill them. <laughs> Wherefore did you so? Who can be wise, amazed, Temperate and furious, loyal and neutral in a moment? No man. The expedition of my violent love outrun the pause of reason. Here lay Duncan, his silver skin laced with his gold and blood. His gash stabs looked to be a breach in nature for ruin's wasteful entrance. And there, the murderers, steeped in the color of their trade, their daggers unmannerly breached with gore. Who could refrain? that had a heart to love, and in that heart, courage to make his love known. Help me hence. Oh. Look to the lake. Why do we hold our tongues that most may claim this argument for ours? What should be spoken here? For our fate, hidden in an auger hole, may rush and seize us. Let's away. Our tears are not yet brewed. Nor our strong sorrow upon the foot of motion. Look to the lady. And when we have our naked frailties hid, let suffer an exposure. Let us meet and question this most bloody piece of work to know it further. Fears and scruples shake us. In the great hand of God I stand, and thence, against the undivulged pretense, I fight of treasonous malice, and so do I. So, so all! Let's briefly put on manly readiness and meet in the hall together. Well, well contented. What will you do to show an unfelt sorrow is an office which the false man does easy? All to England. To Ireland I. Our separated fortune shall keep us both the same. Where we are, there's daggers in men's smiles. The nearer in blood, the nearer bloody. This murderous shaft that hath shot hath not yet lightened. And our safest way is to avoid the aim. Therefore, to horse, and let us not be dainty of leave-taking, but shift away. There is warrant in that theft, which steals itself when there's no mercy left. Strange, but this sore night hath trifled former knowings. 
Oh, good father, thou seest the heavens as troubled with man's act, threatens his bloody stage. By the clock tis day, and yet dark night strangles the traveling lamp. Is night's predominance for the day's shame that darkness is the face of earth and tomb, and living light should kiss it? Tis unnatural, even like the deed that's done. On Tuesday last, a falcon, towering in her pride of place, was by a mousing owl hawked at and killed. <coughs> and Duncan's horses, a thing most strange and certain, beauteous and swift, the minions of their race turned wild in nature, broke their stalls, flung out, Contending against obedience as would they make war with mankind. Tis said they eat each other. They did so, to the amazement of mine eyes that looked upon. Here comes the good Macduff. How goes the world, sir, now? I see you not. Is it known who did this more than bloody deed? Those that Macbeth hath slain. Alas, the day. What good could they pretend? They were suborn. And now, Malcolm and Donald Bain, the king's two sons, have stolen away and fled, which puts upon them suspicion of the deed. Against nature still. Thriftless ambition that will raven up their own lives' means. <coughs> then, tis most like the sovereignty will fall upon Macbeth. He is already named and he's gone to scone to be invested. Where is Duncan's body? Carried to Colmakill, ancient storehouse of his predecessors and guardian of their bones. Will you just go? No, cousin. I'll to fight. Well, I will hit there. See, things well done there. Else our old robes rest easier than our new. Adieu. <laughs> Farewell, Father. God's benison go with you, and with those that would make good of bad, and friends of foes. most foully for it. And yet it was said, it should not stand in thy posterity, but that myself should be the root and father of many kings. If truth come from them, as upon thee, Macbeth, their speech is shy. Why, by the verities on thee made good, may they not be my oracles as well, and set me up in hope? But hush. No more. Here's our chief guest. If he had been forgotten, it had been as a gap in our great feast, and all thing unbecoming. Tonight, we hold the solemn supper. Sir, I'll request your presence. Let your highness command upon me to the which my duty shall with the most indissoluble tie. Ah, right this afternoon? Aye, my good lord. Ah, we should have else desired your good advice, which still hath been both grave and prosperous in this day's council, but we'll take it tomorrow. As far you right. As far, my lord, as will fill up the time twixt this and supper. Go not my horse the better, I must become a borrower of the night for the dark hour of twain. Fill not our feast. My lord, I will not. We hear our bloody cousins are bestowed in England and in Ireland, not confessing their cruel parricide and filling their hearers with strange invention. But of that tomorrow, from there with all we shall have cause of state craving us jointly. Hi, to horse, adieu. 
Terry, return this night. Goes playoffs with you? Aye, my good lord. Our time does call upon us. I wish your horses swift and sure of foot, and so I do commend you to their backs. Farewell. Let every man be master of his time till seven at night. To make society the sweeter welcome, we will keep ourselves till supper time alone. Well then, God be with you. Sirrah, a word with you. Attend those men our pleasure. They are, my lord, without the palace gate. Bring them before us. To be thus is nothing, but to be safely thus. Our fears and banquo stick deep into that royalty of nature, reigns that food would be feared. Tis much he dares into that dauntless temper of his mind. He hath the wisdom which doth guide his valor to act in safety. There is none but he who is being I do fear. Under him, my genius is rebuked, as it was said Mark Antony's was by Caesar. He chid the sisters, when first they put the name of king upon me, and bade them speak to him. Then, prophet-like, they hailed him father to a line of kings. Upon my head they placed a fruitless crown. Put a barren scepter in my grip, thus to be rent with an unlineal hand. No son of mine succeeding. If it be so, for Banquo's issue have I filed my mind. For them, the gracious Duncan hath I murdered. Only for them, and mine eternal jewel given to the common enemy of man to make them kings, the seeds of Banquo kings. Rather than so, come fate to the list and champion me to the utterance. Who's there? Now go to the door and stay there till we call. Was it not yesterday we spoke together? It was, so please your highness. Well then. Now have you considered of my speeches? Know that it was he in past times which held you so under fortune that you thought of Ben Hour and himself. And this I made good to you in our last conference, passed in probation with you, how you were born in hand, how cross the instrument you wrought with them, and all things else that you might have a soul into a notion craze, say, thus did Banquo. You had made it known to us. I did so, which is now our point of second meeting. Do you find your patience so predominant in your nature that you can let this go? Are you so gospel to pray for this good man whose heavy hand hath bowed you to the grave and beggared yours forever? We are men, my liege. Ah! In the catalogue you go for men as hounds, greyhounds, mongrels, spaniels, curs, shells, water rogues, and demi wolves are all clipped by the name of dogs. The value file distinguishes the swift, the slow, the subtle, the housekeeper. The hunter, each one according to the gift which bounteous nature hath in him closed, whereby he does receive particular addition from the bill that writes them all alike, and so of men. Now, if you have a station that's file, not to the worst rank of manhood, then say it, and I will put this business in your bosoms, whose execution takes your enemy off, grapples you to the heart and love of us who wear our health but sickly in his life, which in his death were perfect. I am one, my liege, whom the vile blows and befets the world, has so incensed that I am reckless in what I do despite the world. And I another, 
so weary with disasters. Tugged with fortune, that I would set my life on any chance to mend it, or be ridden it. Both of you know Banquo was your enemy. True, True my lord. lord. So he is mine. And in such bloody distance, that every minute of his being thrust against my nearest of life, and though I could, with bare-faced power, sweep him from my sight and bid my will avouch it, yet I must not. For certain friends that are both his and mine, whose loves I may not drop, but wail his fall as I myself struck down. Thence it is that I to your assistance do make love, masking the business from the common eye for sundry, weighty reasons. We shall, my lord, perform what you command us. Though our lives... Your spirit shine through you. Within this hour's most, I will advise you where to plant yourselves, acquaint you with the perfect spy of the time and the moment on it, for it must be done tonight in something away from the palace. I always thought I required a clearness. And with him, to leave no rubs nor botches in the work, Fleance, his son, who keeps him company, whose absence is no less material to me than is his father's, must embrace the fate of that dark hour. Resolve yourselves apart. I'll come to you anon. We are, are resolved, resolved, my lord. lord. I'll call upon you straight. Abide within. It is concluded. Banquo, thy soul's flight, if it find heaven, must find it out tonight. Herself, whilst our poor malice remains in danger of her former tooth. But let the frame of things disjoint. Both our worlds will suffer, ere we will eat our meals in fear and sleep in the affliction of these terrible dreams that shake us nightly. That should be with the dead, whom we to gain our peace have sense to peace, that on the torture of the mind to lie in restless ecstasy. Duncan is in his grave. After life's fitful fever, he sleeps well. Treason has done his worst, nor steel, nor poison, malice, domestic, foreign loving, nothing can touch him further. Come on, gentle, my lord. Sleek all your rugged looks. Be bright and jovial among your guests tonight. And so shall I love. And so I pray be you. Let your remembrance apply to Banquo. Present him eminence, both with eye and tongue. Unsafe the while that we must lave our honors in these flattering streams, 
making our faces visits to our hearts, disguising what they are. You must leave this. Oh, full of scorpions is my mind, dear wife. Thou knowest that Banquo and his fleance lives. But in them nature's copies, not eternal. There's comfort, yet they are assailable. Be thou Jokan. Ere the bat hath flown his cloistered flight, ere to black Hecate summons the shard-born beetle whose drowsy hums hath rung night's yawning peal, there shall be done a deed of dreadful note. What's to be done? Be innocent of the knowledge, dearest Chuck, till thou applaud the deed. Come, sealing night, scarf up the tender eye of pitiful day, and with thy bloody and invisible hand cancel and tear to pieces that great bond which keeps me pale. Light thickens, and the crow makes wing to the rooky wood. Good things of day begin to droop and drowse, while night's black agents to their praise do rouse. Thou marvellous step my words, but hold thee still. Things bad begun make strong themselves by ill. So prithee, go with me. did bid thee join with us. Macbeth, he needs not a mistrust, since he delivers us our offices, and the direction just. Then stand with us. The west yet glimmers with some streaks of day. Now spurs the Latin traveler apace to gain a timely aim. Near approaches the subject of our watch. Hark! I hear horses! Already are in court. These horses go about almost a mile, so it is usual, so all men do, making the walk from hence to the palace gate. A light, a light! Tis he! Stand to it. Well, let's away and say how much is done. 